Good morning, and welcome to First United Methodist Church in Middlebury, Indiana. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. We have a few announcements and reminders for you as we begin this day, so let's dive right in. First, we are still taking requests to send out candy grams. In fact, these is what these beautiful things look like. Isn't this fun? Enjoy it. Uh, these are still going out, so you can send in a request to the church office. You can go online and fill out the form, um, but we'll send them anywhere here in the community and deliver them in a COVID-safe fashion, uh, but lots of fun throughout the month of February to let people in our community know that they are loved and cared for. This week is Ash Wednesday, and we will be worshiping in a slightly different way. We are going to have a Zoom service at 7 p.m., and there is a liturgy that you can get a hold of to walk through at home. We will send it out via church email. You can message the church office through the Facebook page, through email, or give us a phone call, and we would be glad to get that to you. We will also have the opportunity to drive through here at the church from noon to one and five to six to receive ashes on your forehead. So that is noon to one and five to six for drive through ashes. And then our Zoom worship service will be at 7 p.m. And that link will be available on Facebook as well as through uh, our church's email. We have a book study coming up on Tuesday evening at 6 30. We are following up on chapters three and four from the Falling Upward uh, book by Richard Rohr, and you are most welcome to join us for that. There is a Zoom link available on our Facebook event page for the book study, or you can call the church office and get a hold of that. Uh, but we'd love to see you on Tuesday at 6.30. Finally, we will be relaunching in-person worship services on Sunday, March 7th. We will have a 9 a.m. Uh, more formal service, and we will have a slightly more casual service at 11 a.m. You will need to contact the church office for call-ahead seating so that we can make sure to prepare a place for you. Masks and social distancing will be required. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday, March 7th. If you are not quite yet ready to join us in person, we will still have a live stream worship service option available for you. We do encourage you to continue to consider the ways in which you've been blessed and how you can support the ministries of this church financially. You can give online through our website or you can contact the church office. We do ask that you also consider sharing this video on your own Facebook page, emailing it out to friends and family, and otherwise finding ways to share the worship services for our church. It's a great, great way to reach out into the community. And finally, if you have any prayer requests, you are always welcome to put them in the comment section to email the church office, give us a call, um, or whichever way you'd prefer to contact us. We would love to pray for you in whichever ways are meaningful for you. Well, today we are wrapping up the end of our, worship, of our sermon series, An Altar in the World, by talking about fighting with your spouse. And we are so excited to hear Caleb preach and hear the message that God has given to him and to uh, find out the ways in which this, is, this has unfolded. So now I invite you to turn your hearts and your minds toward God as we begin to participate in worship this morning through our call to worship. Our call to worship. This world is not as we want it to be. Our relationships are severed by virus and disease, by political discord, by phobias and isms and hatred, by our fears and insecurities, and still we choose to worship. Come, be one together through technology and the divine spirit that sparkles and twinkles its unending love between and within us. Good morning. I'm so glad I get to be with you this morning to share the children's sermon. So, um, and it's Valentine's Day. And when I think about Valentine's Day, I always think about love. And so I was thinking about that, but I was thinking, you know what? Sometimes I don't feel very lovable. In fact, I feel pretty unlovable. I, I get grumpy and I think about all the things that other people can do that I can't do. So like Pastor Allison, she not only can preach, but she can sing and play the piano. 
So he, I play in the handbell choir, but I want to let you in on a secret. Mr. Pohl, he writes all the notes in for me because I don't know how to read music. Isn't that nice of him? So that I can still play. But I think, oh boy, I don't know if God loves me as much as he loves those other people that are really good at doing lots of things that I can't do. And I found this book that I want to share with you. And it kind of sums up how I feel sometimes. So the book is called Unlovable. And I want to read it to you. Alfred was unlovable. At least that's what the cat told him every chance he got. You've got the ugliest mug I've ever seen. No one could love you. Alfred tried his best to ignore the remarks, but it was difficult, especially since the cat had taught the parrot to say, unlovable, squawk, unlovable. Whenever Alfred walked by, the goldfish gurgled in agreement. But what was it that made him unlovable? His snoring, the way he ate, his little curly tail? None of the neighborhood dogs would have a thing to do with him. His mouth is too small to hold a ball, a big German shepherd sneered. His legs are way too short for running, snickered a greyhound. A pampered poodle chuckled. Did you see that face? Beat it, shrimp, growled a Doberman. You couldn't even scare a mailman. Alfred didn't like staying in the house since the cat was always making fun of him. The parrot was always squawking unlovable and the goldfish was always gurgling in agreement. So Alfred spent most of his time alone in the backyard. One day, a new family moved in next door. Alfred tried to see if they had a dog who might be his friend, but he was too little to look over the fence. As he was sniffing around, he heard something on the other side. Hello, Alfred called. Hi, came the answer. I'm Rex. I just moved in. My name is Alfred. And without thinking, he blurted out, I'm a golden retriever. Glad to meet you, Rex replied. Alfred and Rex talked for hours. Alfred said he liked sleeping in the sun, dog food, and scratching. Rex did too. Rex said he hated baths and going to the vet. Alfred did too. It began to get dark and soon it was time for dinner and they both went inside. That night, Alfred thought about how much he liked Rex and how much they had in common. Then he thought about the fib he had told. Alfred was sure they'd be friends as long as Rex never saw how unlovable he was. The next day, when Alfred and Rex were chatting, a squirrel jumped onto the fence between them. They both barked at it. The squirrel took one look at Alfred and climbed up a tree. Rex said, you sure showed that squirrel who's boss, Alfred. But Alfred was thinking, if Rex ever sees me, he'll run away too. I'm going to dig a hole under the fence, Rex said one day. Then I can squeeze through to your side and we can meet. Alfred heard Rex digging. When he heard Rex wiggle under the fence, he ran and hid behind a bush. Then he heard Rex call, Alfred, where are you? Suddenly, Rex poked his head into the bush where Alfred was hiding. Hey, you look just like me, gasped Alfred. Wow, this is great, said Rex. You're not a golden retriever after all. Alfred had to laugh. Who cared what the others said? Rex was his friend, and Rex liked him just the way he was. Together, Alfred and Rex ran, they jumped, they played, and Alfred never felt unlovable again. Isn't that a great story? So it made me think about, like, sometimes I think, does God really love me? Because, ooh, sometimes I feel pretty unlovable. 
well, I found this great verse. And it's in Romans. It's 838, and it's from the New Life Version. And it says, for I know that nothing can keep us from the love of God. Death cannot, life cannot, angels cannot, leaders cannot, any other power cannot. Hard things now or even in the future cannot. Isn't that great? So if you're like me and sometimes feel unlovable, it's okay because God loves us anyways. He loves us just the way we are, just like Rex and Alfred. Let's say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you love us even when we feel unlovable. Help each one of these kids to feel that love this week and to share that love with others. Amen. Have a great week, guys. Scripture reading is from Romans chapter 14, verses 13 through 19. So stop judging each other. Instead, this is what you should decide. Never put a stumbling block or obstacle in the way of your brother or sister. I know and I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is wrong to each in itself. But if someone 
think something is wrong to eat, it becomes wrong for that person. If your brother or sister is upset by your food, you are no longer walking in love. Don't let your food destroy someone for whom Christ died, and don't let something you consider to be good be criticized as wrong. God's kingdom is about eating food and drinking, but about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ this way pleases God and gets human approval. So let's strive for the things that bring peace and the things that build each other up. We thank you for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God within us, and for the word of God among us. Uh, well, would you all join me in a word of prayer this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you for this morning, for this life, for the food that you have given us to shelter, to uh, everything that we have. Uh, Lord, we want to thank you and praise you for that. God, I want to thank you for everyone viewing here. I appreciate them uh, tuning in. God, and I just pray that this message that is about to be delivered, I pray that it is of you and from you and not from any uh, human understanding, but of yours. And I want to pray all of these things in your heavenly name. Amen. Well, welcome and good morning. I am super excited that you have uh, decided to worship with us this morning. And this morning, I'm seeing a lot more faces here in the sanctuary, which is awesome. I love all of the pictures and, and the different things here. Uh, it's much, much better than preaching to uh, an empty sanctuary. I do want to notice that today is Valentine's Day. It is a day that is marked by showing love to one's significant other. And if you don't have a significant other, it's a day that we kind of remember to show love to other people. I would figure it would be somewhat fitting to talk about love and marriage, considering the fact that I have been married for about two and a half years now, and I have it all figured out, and I'm going to give you all advice in the cheat sheet to marriage, and I'm giving you all the tips and tricks so that you know what to do within your marriage, and that's the topic of today's sermon coming from the man who's probably been married the least amount of time. Uh, with all of us here this morning. Uh, no, I will actually not be talking about that because between you and me, right, I spend most of my time with really no idea how to operate uh, this discourse of marriage. And if you were to ask me honestly about my opinion on Valentine's Day, I'd probably pay homage to Ron Swanson by saying it's just another holiday invented by Hallmark in order to sell greeting cards. In reality, though, I do want to take this time to discuss ways in which we preach this idea of love and peace to others. And that includes our spouse. So here's a question for you all this morning. If we only showed love to our spouse on Valentine's Day, would that make us a very good spouse? Probably not. Uh, we'd probably hear it, at least I would hear it from my wife, to be a little more uh, proactive into showing her love. And so it, beyond Valentine's Day, I know we recognize this day as a way to show uh, love to our significant other, but we want to do that beyond Valentine's Day, right? So likewise, if we tune in or walk into this sanctuary like we, we, we will soon on Sunday mornings, and if we profess Christ's love and then walk out these doors or tune off our live stream and then not show Christ's love again until the next Sunday, would that make us very good followers of Christ? 
Likewise, to showing love in marriage once a year, showing the love of Christ once a week would probably get us in the category of doing, not doing what we're supposed to do. So in looking at this holiday of love and cherishing how it is we do love, do show love to those around us, if we are truly to strive for the things and bring peace that builds each other up, as Jordan amazingly read for us, I would argue that this professing of peace and love first begins at home, right in our context, before we practice outpouring those things beyond ourselves. Tish Warren writes in her book, The Liturgy of the Ordinary, that I often neglect the obvious. I proclaim a radical love for the world, even as I neglect to care for those closest to me. But I am increasingly aware that I cannot seek God's peace and mission in the world without beginning right where I am. In my home, in my neighborhood, in my church, with the real people right around me. You see, being agents of peace and striving to build each other up seems easy, right? Oh yeah, that's, that, we're not going to bring people down. We're going to lift each other up. That's our mission. That's what we're going to do. Ra ra ra. It's a lot easier said uh, than done. I remember back in elementary school when I lived in Illinois. I'm not sure if this was a thing in Indiana, so this might go uh, over all of your heads. But I remember as a uh, young boy in second, third, fourth grade, uh, we had this thing called the Peace Builder Initiative. And so every morning, right after we said the Pledge of Allegiance, we would say the Peace Builder Pledge. And we would put up a little peace sign just like this, and we would recite these words. I am a peace builder. I pledge to praise people, to give up put downs, to seek wise people, to notice and speak up about hurts I have caused, to right wrongs, to help others. I will build peace at home, at school, and in my community each day. And thus ends the Peace Builder Pledge. And it was part of this initiative in the public school system to uh, create agents of peace at home, at school, in the community, and it was a way to get these young kids repeating the notion that we do not want to put people down. We want to lift people up. It's, it's a scriptural teaching, and we want to seek people who are wiser than we are. That's, that's always my goal. I want to find the, the smartest person in the room or the wisest person in the room, and if it's me, I'm switching rooms. You know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to seek uh, wisdom. You know, I'm not sure how long that initiative lasted, when it started. I don't even know if it's still going on to this day. Uh, but I'm sure some of my Illinoisan friends, if you're watching this uh, this morning, you got some flashbacks to uh, our days in elementary school. But I want to talk about one of the most important things about that pledge or about being a peace builder. And see, one of the most important things is that I want to us all to notice that our words can have a positive or negative impact on those around us. You see, the start of the pledge states we want to praise people or to strive to build them up, as Paul says. And we want to give up, to release, to not do anymore, putting people down being negative. We don't want to strive to destroy people. We want to strive to build each other up. Very, very similar to what Paul says in Romans. 
Paul isn't the only writer either to notice the ways in which we talk to one another, the ways in which we relate to one another and speak about one another is important and has an amazingly huge impact to those around us and to those we interact with. James, the brother of Jesus, uh, youth friends that have been uh, listening in and tuning into our uh, youth uh, gatherings, you know that we've been talking about James here the past couple weeks, so you'll get a sneak peek to some of my lessons here in the future. Uh, but the youth and I have been talking about James, and, and James is the brother of Jesus. So A, talk about your high standards there, uh, being the brother of the Savior of the entire world. That's uh, quite a big standard. Uh, but James wrote this letter, right, and he outlines just how damaging or uplifting our words can be. Uh, if you want to turn with me this morning or look up on Bible Gateway in another tab, uh, we will be reading out of James chapter 3, and it will be uh, verses 6 through 12. So I will give you all a moment to uh, turn there before I begin reading. All right, so James chapter 3, verse 6 through 12. So James writes, The tongue is a small flame of fire, a world of evil at work in us. It contaminates our entire lives. Because of it, the circle of life is set on fire. The tongue itself is set on fire by the flames of hell. Pretty powerful imagery there. People can tame and already have tamed every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish. No one can tame the tongue, though. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we both bless the Lord and Father and curse human beings made in God's image. Blessing and cursing come from the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, it should not be this way. Both fresh water and salt water don't come from the same spring, do they? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree produce olives? Can a grapevine produce figs? Of course not. Fresh water doesn't flow from a salt water spring either. James doesn't hold anything back here, does he? He uses uh, some pretty powerful imagery here to explain just how uplifting or damaging our tongue can be. And when he talks about the tongue, uh, he talks about the words that spring forth from our mouth. The things that we say to one another can have either a huge damaging effect on them or it could bring them the peace and love of God. It can either bless or it can curse. Which means, leads me to this question. How many of you in here this morning have ever heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me? Well, unfortunately, I see a lot of faces, but not a lot of hands being raised. But I guess, you know, I guess pictures can't raise their hands. And if they did, I'd probably be running out of this uh, building right now. But I am sure, I am confident that the majority of you watching this morning have heard that phrase. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words may never hurt me. And I want to tell you this morning that that phrase is utter garbage. Utter, utter garbage. 
See, we say it to kids all the time, and I've tuned into many kids' lessons looking at resources, and to this day, they still have that phrase in a lot of kids' lessons, and, and I cannot fathom that phrase because not only is it not true, it is completely the opposite of what the Bible teaches. You see, the Bible teaches that the words that come out of our mouths can inflict pain on the levels of hell. Seems a little bit more painful than sticks and stones. Because in all honesty, hellfire or sticks and stones, I'm choosing the sticks and stones. And so I want, to, I want us to understand this morning that the words that come out of our mouths the things that we say to others, our actions and deeds, the way we relate to one another can be extremely damaging to those around us. However, it can, those words and deeds and actions can bring hope and we can build each other up, right? That's what Paul says in Romans. We strive for the peace so that we can build each other up. And then James comes in and gives a warning. He says, yes, you can build each other up. And we want to do that. But I am warning you here that you can also inflict pain and hurt upon others and you may not even know it. Words hurt. To illustrate this point, I want to bring us out of this sanctuary, and I'm going to invite you all uh, into my home where I'm going to, there's a little bit of a marriage lesson here this Valentine's Day, and kind of give you an insight into some of the ways that uh, my wife and I have fought over in the past, and just how something so small can ignite a fire that flames even more uh, fighting between the two of us. So uh, beam me up, Gene, and we will head over to my home. Thank you, Gene, for that smooth transition. I want to welcome you all into my kitchen, uh, where uh, I will admit is usually the start of the feuds that uh, my wife and I have with each other. So uh, the illustration I want to use this morning uh, has to do with my dirty dishes or our dirty dishes. Uh, You see, neither Brie nor I really like to do the dishes. In fact, it is like the one chore that both of us actively avoid. And when we got married, we had to operate and we had to figure out a way uh, to communicate clearly or communicate effectively as to who was going to do the dishes because both of us work, both of us don't like coming home and saying all these dirty dishes and either having to do them or, you know, all these kind of things. And and so we, we found this, this way of, we have, we have a rotation, it's a rotation base. Um, you know, if, if I've done the dishes already, then it's her turn to do the dishes and we communicate that and it goes back and forth. Um, I will admit there are some days where I know that it is her turn to do the dishes and I'll come home from work or, you know, doing something and I'll see a pile of dirty dishes in the sink and uh, me being me, I'm much like Chandler being, I don't have much in the way of advice, but I can interest you in a sarcastic comment, Uh, but I will give some sort of snarky, sarcastic, oh, what, when do you plan on doing the dishes kind of remark, or, hey, do you know there are dishes in the sink? You know, kind of those passive aggressive kind of ideas, and and sometimes I'm even aggressive saying, hey, it's your turn to do the dishes, do them. So, of course, it's not a very Uh, uplifting or peaceful thing to do when I know those things, those remarks will spark a further fight or further discourse between my wife and I. And and all of a sudden, that one snarky, sarcastic comment turns into a full-blown fight or argument over something that now has nothing to do with the dishes, but it was all derivative of that one snarky comment that I had made and that I am really guilty of and have to watch that. And so now I try to find ways or, you know, I will admit I do fall (laughs) a lot of times and 
Uh, sometimes I fall in that snarky comment and I have to reorient my thinking and try to strive for peaceful things, right? Trying to find ways to, so you know what, maybe if it's not my turn to do the dishes, to swallow my pride and, and even though I'm tired and I know I don't want to do them, I do them uh, instead and even avoid what James calls the hellfire that is our tongue. So I won't even say anything uh, and just get them done. And, and so it's, you know, real life, you know, I definitely see the teaching of James here uh, in the fact that the ways that we talk to each other, the things that come out of our mouths can spark such negative and destructive things. And, and I want to be, like as Paul says, I want to strive to be a peacemaker in my world. And how can I strive to be a peacemaker outside of this place if I can't be a peacemaker with my own wife. And so the dishes are just one example of ways in which that sometimes it's, it's better not to give that snarky comment. It's better not to, to say the thing that we know is going to lead towards destruction and, and incorporate the, the fires of hell. And so I want to thank you for, again, joining me in my kitchen here and uh, I have dishes to do, so I'm not going to make you uh, watch you watch me do the dishes, uh, but I uh, want to transition back uh, and give it back to uh, Pastor Caleb as he finishes up our sermon here this morning. So back to you, Pastor Caleb. All right. Thanks, Pastor Caleb, for uh, that illustration. Uh, honestly, I wish my transport from work and home could go that quickly every time, but unfortunately, the technology has yet to be invented. Uh, so I'm just, I'm striving for that too. I'm striving for peace and striving for uh, teleportation technology. Uh, but just in that illustration, in Bree and I's marriage, it's not necessarily the big things that set us off. We can usually talk through some of the big things, the challenges, the anxieties, and those other things. It's, it's the small things that unleash a hellfire onto each other that, that needs to be remedied. That simple question of, hey, are you going to do the dishes? That's the small hellfire spark. That snarkiness, right? The sarcasm of, hey, I know the dishes aren't done, and it's your turn to do it. Why aren't you doing them? Those words are damaging. It doesn't seem like it. But if we are truly to strive for peace, what, what replaces those words? Do we even need to say anything or, or do we just, do we become a servant and do the dishes? It's something I need to be reminded of. Our words set ablaze an argument that eventually has nothing to do with the dishes. We bring up things that we had already talked over and we bring them back up and yell them at each other and, and ends up not being about the dishes at all. Maybe many of you can understand that sentiment as well. However, but, however beyond marriage, how do our words and actions affect those around us? Does the way we interact and speak to one another, to our neighbors, to the people in this community, do, does the way that we speak and act reflect the peace and love of Christ? Or does it ignite and spark fires and dissent and division? So I want this holiday of love to be a reminder to us all that not only should we show love to our spouses every day of the year, all right, men, every day, come on, we got to pick it up, uh, but also that if we are to proclaim God's love and profess peace on Sunday mornings, we need to put that into practice Monday through Saturday. Peace and love begin at home. It begins in our interactions with our spouse. It begins in our interactions with our kids or even the barista at the local coffee shop or the cashier at the store. Even with how we interact on social media. Yes, everything you share and type are words that are coming out of your mouth and are now contacted and contributed to you. Are the things that you are posting and sharing uplifting? Or are they sparking and igniting fires? 
How are your small actions and words affecting those around you? Proclaiming the radical love of Christ does nothing if we are not peacemakers within our own community or even our own home. Practice peace daily. Daily by striving to build each other up in word and in deed. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that we would be peacemakers and peace builders in our world, in our community, in our neighborhood, and even in our own home. Lord, I pray that as we go out and interact with others, as we speak to one another, as we post on social media, Lord, that everything we say and do strives to build each other up, strives to bring peace to those around us. Lord, I just pray that our actions do not ignite any fires, that they do not damage or put others down. Lord, that we would be reminded every day to build each other up. Lord, I pray to remember to do the dishes so that I don't spark any arguments with my wife because I know uh, that it is something that neither of us enjoy doing. And so I pray this in your heavenly name. Amen. Thank you for joining us and... Uh, Thank you that you've tuned in, uh, and we would uh, love to have you all back uh, worshiping with us next week. I want to offer a uh, benediction to us all this morning as a reminder, right, that as we leave this place, as we hit X on the internet browser, or if we hit the power button on the TV, uh, that we are called to be instruments of peace to those around us. And it all begins at home. Let us pray the prayer that's often attributed uh, to St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, 
Make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it's in giving that we receive, and it's in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it's in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Go with God.